Wow, this is amazing. I have the honor of introducing Christopher Sykes. Chris is a TV documentary producer based in London. He has made about 70 documentaries. He is probably best known, especially in this crowd, for the films he made with and about my father. In fact, for many years, when someone at a party asked him what he did, Chris would say, I make films about Richard Feynman. <laughs> in 1981, Chris was considering a documentary about Freeman Dyson when Dr. Dyson said, there's someone far more interesting than I am. Perhaps you should be making a film about him, and suggested Chris contact my father. For anyone who knew my father, you may have an idea of how that first phone call went. My father was protective of his time and usually said no to queries like this, but he agreed to see Chris in person, and thankfully for all of us, Chris engaged him in the idea, and my father agreed to do the documentary. When Chris tried to show him the rough cut of the pleasure of finding things out, he refused, saying, if the thing's any good, that's to your credit, and if it's lousy, that's your problem. <laughs> As we all know, it was fantastic. When it aired in the United States in 1984, it became one of Nova's most popular and critically acclaimed shows and was even nominated for an Emmy. Many of the reviewers seemed surprised that they enjoyed it because they had never seen anything like it. A documentary about a physicist that was so entertaining while presenting its subject in such a unique way. A review from the British newspaper The Guardian. With superb self-control, Christopher Sykes did not insert any fussy gussets in the pure line of the program. No interviewer, no questions, no illustrations about the bomb or the pope or the atom or anything at all, but Feynman talking, and what's more, thinking. This review, and others like it, thus recognized what an extraordinary collaboration had in fact occurred, a partnership between a great scientist and a great documentarian. These films are a lasting tribute to my father and are this generation's best chance to see him in action and discover how funny, irreverent, and interesting he was. My family and I will forever be grateful to Chris for his efforts. Here is my friend, Christopher Sykes. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> Good luck. She's kind enough to introduce me, but I get to introduce her father. Um, and that's going to be in the form of a few short film clips, uh, which I hope will give you some real sense of what it was like to be with him and listen to him. Um, I think everybody knows the story of how Feynman's blackboards in his office here at Caltech were photographed after he left his office for the last time in early 1988. Um, there are many interesting things on these blackboards. The most famous has to be, best known I should say, is, um, is, is a remark in, in the top left-hand corner which says, uh, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Now far less famous, but of great interest to me, is, um, is a note which said, says, uh, uh, do I want BBC interview? <laughs> now, uh, Feynman had considered this, this difficult question on at least three occasions that I know of, and the reason I know is because I was the person from the BBC who was asking him to do the interviews. Um, the first time, as Michel has explained, was it's actually 30 years ago, uh, in 1981, and, and she's told the story of how that happened. Um, uh, Feynman agreed to sit down in an armchair at his sister-in-law's house in Yorkshire, England, um, and, and just talk about his love of science, and that became the film The Pleasure of Finding Things Out. The next time Feynman decided to say yes uh, was in 1983, and uh, he sat down in another armchair, but this time in, in, in his home here in Altadena. And, and this time he, he really he sort of thought aloud about the imagination needed to understand just how strange and wonderful nature really is. And that became a series of um, short BBC films called Fun to Imagine. The last time he decided to say yes was uh, a sadder time, really. It was in early 19, 
88, the time of the, the note on the, uh, the photographs, on, the notes on the blackboard. Um, and uh, he was by now very ill. Um, and he thought that talking about his fascination, which he shared with his friend Ralph Leighton, for a remote Central Asian country called Tanutuva might take his mind off how sick he felt. And it did, and it worked fabulously well. He really enjoyed it. Um, and he told the most amazing stories about this strange country and everything that goes on there, and about his and Ralph's efforts to somehow get there. Um, and he also talked about other things, like his, um, his part in the, in the inquiry into the Challenger disaster. My wife, Lottie, recorded all this on a um, home video camera, and it turned into, a, uh, I suppose, a sad but very inspiring film called The Quest for Tenutuva. Here in, in the USA, it was shown on PBS under the title Last Journey of a Genius. The film ends with um, a remarkable scene of Feynman and Ralph Leighton uh, celebrating life on the drums and singing their crazy orange juice song, which I think is going to be shown at some time at this wonderful event. So, I think it's great that Feynman kept saying, yes, I want the BBC interview, because uh, these films are there now, and I hope they'll be there for a long, long time for um, everybody to have a chance to meet Feynman face to face. So, here he is. I have a friend who's an artist and has sometimes taken a view which I don't agree with very well. He'll hold up a flower and say, look how beautiful it is. And I'll agree, I think. And he says, you see, as I as an artist can see how beautiful this is, but you as a scientist, oh, take this all apart and it becomes a dull thing. And I think that he's kind of nutty. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people and to me too. I believe, although I may not be quite as refined as aesthetically as he is, that I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. At the same time, I see much more about the flower than he sees. I could imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension of one centimeter. There's also beauty at a smaller dimensions. The inner structure, also the processes, the fact that the colors and the flower are evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see the color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms? That are, does it, why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions which the science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. It only adds. I don't understand how it subtracts. It's interesting that some people find science uh, so easy and others find it kind of dull and difficult, it, it, especially kids, you know, some of them are just eat it up. And I don't know why it is. It's the same perhaps for all subjects. For instance, lots of people love music and I never could carry a tune. And uh, it's, I lose a great deal of pleasure out of that. And I think people lose a lot of pleasure who find science dull. In the case of science, I think that one of the things that make it very difficult is it takes a lot of imagination. It's very hard to imagine all the crazy things that things really are like. You see a little drop of water, a tiny drop, and uh, the atoms attract each other. They like to be next to each other. They want as many partners as they can get. Now, the guys that are at the surface have only partners on one side here in the air on the other side, so they're trying to get in, and you can imagine this team of people, these teeming people, all moving very fast, all trying to get to have as many partners as possible, and the guys at the edge are very unhappy and nervous, and they keep pounding in, trying to get in, and that makes it a tight ball instead of a flat. And that's what, you know, surface tension, the way you, you, when you realize, when you see how sometimes a water drop sits like this on a table, then you start to imagine why it sits like that, because everybody's trying to get into the water. and. Uh, at the same time, while all this is happening, there are these atoms that are leaving the surface and the water drop is slowly disappearing. I find myself trying to imagine all kinds of things all the time, and I get a kick out of it, just like a runner gets a kick out of sweating. <laughs> I get a kick out of thinking about these things. Uh, I can't stop. I mean, I, you could make, I could talk forever. Some 
kid threw up a plate in the cafeteria, which has a blue medallion on the plate, the Cornell sign in the cafeteria. And as he threw up the plate and it came down, it wobbled and the blue thing went around like this. And I wondered, it seemed to me the blue thing went around faster than the wobble, and I wondered what the relation was between the two. See, I was just playing, no importance at all. So I played around with the equations of motion of uh, rotating things, and I found out that if the wobble is small, the blue thing goes around twice as fast as the wobble goes around. And then I tried to figure out if I could see why that was directly from Newton's laws instead of through the complicated equations, and I worked that out for the fun of it. And then I went to Hans Beta, and I said to him, hey, by the way, I show you something amusing, and I explained this to him. And he said to me, that's very amusing and interesting. He said, but what is the use of it? What? I said, that doesn't make any difference, it hasn't any use. I'm just doing it for the fun of it. And this rotation led me to the problem, a similar problem of the rotation of the spin of an electron, according to Dirac's equation. And that just led me back into quantum electrodynamics, which is the problem I've been working on. And I kept, I kept continuing now to play with it in the relaxed fashion I had originally done. And everything, it's just like in a cork out of a bottle, everything just poured out. I, by the way, in a very short order, worked the things out for which I later won the Nobel Prize. I won't have anything to do with the Nobel Prize. It's a pain in there. <laughs> I don't like honors. I appreciate it for the work that I did and for people who appreciate it, and I notice that other physicists use my work, I don't need anything else. I don't think there's any sense to anything else. I don't see that it makes any point that someone in the Swedish Academy decides that this work is noble enough to receive a prize. I've already got the prize. The prize is the pleasure of finding the thing out, the kick in the discovery, the observation other people use it. Those are the real things. The honors are unreal to me. You ask me if an ordinary person, by studying hard, would get to be able to imagine these things like I imagine. Of course, I was an ordinary person who studied hard. There's no miracle people. It just happens they got interested in this thing and they learned all this stuff. They're just people. There's no talent, a special miracle ability to understand quantum mechanics or a miracle ability to imagine electromagnetic fields that comes without practice and reading and learning and study. So if you say, you take an ordinary person who's willing to devote a great deal of time and study and work and thinking and mathematics and time, then he's become a scientist.